Military service has a number of privileges. Outside of the pride of serving your country, military service can provide benefits that might be hard to acquire otherwise. Health care and education are two common reasons that people can join the service these days. But back in the 1940s, a lot of servicemen were enlisting to help with World War II. Joining the military means you're willing to do whatever it takes to protect the country from evil. Sometimes, though, the country doesn't offer the same protection. While African Americans were allowed into general U.S. military service by the early 1940s, the terms under which they served were often different than that of their white counterparts. This was particularly notable during the latter days of World War II because despite Caucasian soldiers usually being given the correct training in order to carry out their tasks, black soldiers weren't always deemed so high priority, even if the work they were doing was incredibly dangerous. In fact, that's exactly what led to a somewhat forgotten chapter in the country's history taking place on July 17, 1994, when the explosion of the SSEA Bryan killed 320 people, two-thirds of which were black enlistees. In the summer of 1944, World War II was still raging on, with the Allies' counterattack now taking place on two separate fronts. Of course, over in Europe you had ground soldiers working their way across the land en route towards Berlin, while on the other side of the equation, American forces on the Pacific coast were trying their best to reach the Japanese home island by sea. It should go without saying that the need for ammunition was high overall, particularly on the U.S. west coast as things there were constantly running at capacity. That's why Port Chicago, a small town located about 40 miles or 64 kilometers northeast of San Francisco, became such a key location at the time. There were plenty of other military facilities set up all along the coast, but because of its location, few were more prized than this one. The only problem was with it being such a busy spot, it required a lot of workers, and those workers weren't always given the correct training they needed ahead of time in order to carry things out safely. Why was that? Well, the majority of these people were African American servicemen, folks who were at this point still treated very much like second-class citizens when compared to their Caucasian peers. That meant the time and money that was required to properly train them for the jobs they were being asked to do just wasn't seen as something essential. Obviously then, that was a recipe for disaster because the work they were being asked to do at Port Chicago in particular was to load munitions aboard incoming ships, an incredibly dangerous task at the best of times. And if that wasn't risky enough, they weren't even given the time needed to do the job without the correct training as their white officers usually wanted things completed in as speedy a manner as possible. So that was what led to races being conducted amongst teams of loaders with the goal being to see who could win by finishing their work the quickest. It was also reckless that the Longshore Union even caught wind of what was going on after a while and issued a dire warning that if things didn't change, then a catastrophe would be imminent. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon for people in charge to ignore warnings in favor of increased productivity, so they just continued as normal. After all, in their minds what they were doing was working and it was getting the necessary munitions out there to help with the war effort in the fastest way possible. But speed was never a substitute for safety and this fact would finally become a reality that couldn't be ignored when on the evening of July 17th of that year, disaster did indeed strike. That day, the SSEA Bryan, a merchant ship returning from a successful maiden voyage, arrived at Port Chicago in order to restock. But that wasn't the only ship docked at the port that night. No, as well as her, there was also the SS Quinault Victory. So, with double the work to do in getting both loaded up with munitions, cargo workers on the scene were tasked with getting things moving at light speed as one half began the process of transferring 4,600 tons of bombs, depth charges, detonators, 
powder and both large and small caliber munitions of all types onto the Bryan. While that was happening, the other half were preparing to load a further 429 tons of material onto the Quinault Victory. Tragically though, the latter team would never get a chance to do that because, before they could, at around 10.19pm, a massive blast suddenly rocked the port area when both ships exploded within five seconds of each other. What had gone wrong? Well, even years later it still remains unclear, but what seems like the most likely answer is that, due to their lack of training and the rushed nature of their work, one of the soldiers loading up the SSEA Brian made a mistake and caused something to blow up without warning. It was no small-scale explosion, either. No, given all the material that was on the dock at the time, the initial blast created a chain reaction that caused all 5,000-plus tons to go up in an instant. It should go without saying that of the 98 black enlistees who were on board the Brian at the time, as well as the 31 merchant marine crewmen and 31 armed guards who were there too, no one survived. Of course, they weren't the only ones caught up in the explosion though because over on the Quinault Victory, a further 100 African American stevedores, 36 crewmen, and 17 armed guards were also caught up in the proceeding, with each of them also quickly succumbing to the effects of the blast. But then how could they ever be expected to make it out of such a disaster alive when they were at the epicenter of something so catastrophic? The shockwaves were felt as far away as Boulder City, Nevada. Hell, every building located in Port Chicago that night was damaged to some degree, and many of the local citizenry were literally knocked off their feet when the explosion occurred. Even as far away as San Francisco, property damage was reported. At 9,000 feet or 2,800 meters above the now smoldering wreckage of the two ships, a pilot flying over at the time claimed he almost got hit by flying metal chunks as big as a house, with him actually having to go higher in order to avoid a fireball taking him out of the sky completely. That's right, when things had erupted, a mushroom cloud of what was later described as a yellow-orange light had been sent up into the air, creating the equivalent of a 3.4 magnitude earthquake in the surrounding area. And while that was happening, the remains of the Quinault Victory were being catapulted 500 feet into the bay, with one 200-pound fragment actually landing over 2 miles or 3.2 kilometers away. As for the SSEA Brian, however, well, that wouldn't do the same level of traveling because with it being the place where the blast originated, it would instead be pretty much disintegrated. And it wasn't the only thing completely disintegrated that evening either, as large parts of the port itself would also be erased from existence, with what survived not faring much better as vehicles were thrown into the air like toys and secondary explosions were left occurring all over town. It was so bad that some locals even feared it was a sneak attack from the Japanese and that the war had finally hit their homes directly. But it wasn't an attack from the enemy. No, it was just a simple case of poor management leading to a mistake so costly. A whole host of questions would soon be asked about how such a thing could have possibly been allowed to happen. Before any inquiries could formally be carried out, though, a full inventory of the damage would have to be taken. Once that was completed, it only made the disaster feel that much worse in hindsight. Why was that? Well, aside from the 320 people who were on the docks that night and who were instantly killed in the blast, a further 390 local citizens would also be injured to varying degrees, making it the worst home front disaster of World War II. Of course, of these casualties, it would be the African-American community that was hit the hardest as almost 75% of the fatalities and 60% of the injuries were made up of that demographic. As if that wasn't bad enough. As the days went on and reality began to coalesce again, white officers who had been near the scene would be given hardship leave in order to go mentally recover all while the black survivors were instead ordered to clean up the decimated base, including the remains of their dead colleagues. Yep, rather than being sent home, those servicemen who had been put in so much danger prior to the disaster were now thrown right back into the fray like pack mules, with it being left to them to try and find anything that could be used to identify the dead. Obviously then, it was an incredibly traumatic experience. 
In fact, one enlistee who was tasked with such work, Freddie Meeks, later recalled the shock he felt as he collected body parts and put them into baskets like they were nothing but random pieces of flesh and not his former friends. Still, in spite of that, when some of the black soldiers asked to be given the same leave as their white counterparts once this task was done, they were refused outright once more, and that led to a sense of resentment building amongst them as they felt they weren't being treated with the basic humanity and empathy they should have been. Of course, they had every reason to be angry, just as the Military Board of Enquiry had reason to be angry when their subsequent investigation revealed the sheer lack of training the men on the docks that night had been given ahead of time. After all, this whole incident wasn't just one that led to the deaths of a lot of people. It was also a major black eye on the war effort itself right at a time when America needed to look its strongest. That said, such a lack of training wasn't enough for the white generals to be charged with any crime. No, they largely got a pass after Captain N.H. Goss, commanding officer of the Naval Ammunition Depot located at nearby Mare Island, went on record saying no one could be formally blamed for the incident as, quote, there were no close survivors to give evidence of what had happened. In the end, after a memorial service was held for the victims on July 30th and a payment of $3,000 was approved for the families of each man who lost their lives, it was expected the whole thing would just be swept under the rug and business would go back to normal. At least that's what the military hoped, but the surviving black enlistees saw things very differently especially when they found out the grievance payment of $3,000 was originally supposed to be $5,000 and had been reduced by almost half after Mississippi Representative John Rankin learned that most of the victims were African American. That's right, even the most basic financial accommodations the military could have made for the families of the dead were being cheapened out on, causing the growing anger that had already been building to intensify even further. That's exactly why, when those same black soldiers were asked to report to Mare Island Ammunition Depot soon thereafter and instructed to continue their work on the munitions vessel San Gay without any further training or formal explanation of what had happened before, dozens of them simply refused. As far as they saw it, they believed the whole Port Chicago incident could have been avoided in the first place had they just been given correct information about how to carry out the job at the time. But when it became apparent no further training was coming and that they were now expected to just throw themselves into the danger zone once more, they realized they were nothing more than cattle in the military's eyes. Worse than that, because even cattle had a value, something they clearly didn't have in any way. So, with no other way of making their voices heard, 258 African American soldiers effectively went on strike, with them arguing they would do no more until their concerns had been addressed. Now, at this point, the sensible option probably would have been to listen to their concerns and take these on board so that better safety regulations could be initiated in the future. But let's not forget that this was still 1944, and the signing of the Civil Rights Act was a full two decades away. So, instead of offering something like better training, Admiral Carlton Wright and other officers who were based at Mare Island simply offered stern threats to the men should they choose to carry on with their proposed actions. That worked for the most part, as only 50 of them continued to stand their ground after that. Of course, these 50 were well within their rights to do so, as the situation they were being asked to re-enter simply wasn't acceptable. It wasn't as if they were calling for an uprising or anything. They just wanted basic safety to be taken into account. But that's not how the military saw things, as they would actually go as far as to charge them all with being the ringleaders of the refusal to obey a direct order, and as such, each would be court-martialed on charges of mutiny. Yes, it was an extreme route to go down, and one that took each of the accused by surprise, particularly because it didn't reflect the reality of the situation. These weren't criminals. No, they were just servicemen who'd been through an incredibly traumatic experience and wanted assurances things would be different in the future. And it certainly didn't help that leading up to the trial, they'd be made aware the maximum penalty for mutiny was death. Something that no doubt remained in their minds as they took the stand soon thereafter and awaited a final decision about their fates. Luckily though, none of their punishments would be so severe in the end. 
they would still receive hefty prison sentences for their troubles, but their lives were spared. After a near-month-long court battle that saw the prosecution argue the accused were a troublesome bunch even prior to their alleged mutiny, each of them were ultimately found guilty. It didn't matter if the defense was able to make a compelling case against that based on the fact the servicemen in question were clearly suffering from the effects of trauma and were scared to put themselves in a similar situation again. And it didn't seem to matter that one of them was allegedly directly threatened with the firing squad should he choose not to comply with his orders. It didn't even matter that some of the men had been put under great pressure to sign statements claiming they said things they didn't after the fact a move that was very clearly unconstitutional. No, all that mattered was that, in the eyes of the law at the time, or at least Judge Advocate James Coakley's interpretation of it, the very fact that these men had refused to do as ordered was grounds enough to imprison them. That was what led to October 24th of that year, where after an 80-minute deliberation from the court, all 50 of the accused were formally found guilty and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor to be followed by dishonorable discharges. Of course, that would later be amended somewhat so that 40 of the men ended up serving lesser sentences, with 5 receiving 8 years behind bars, 11 of them getting 10 years, and 22 getting slightly less than that. As for the other 12, though, well, they'd all receive a staggering 24 years each under the new reassessment as they were deemed to be the ones most responsible for the supposed mutiny. Needless to say, then, it was a true miscarriage of justice, and it wasn't just the servicemen directly affected who were aware of that. No, after news of the situation got out, both the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt publicly appealed for the men's clemency, albeit unsuccessfully. Still, all hope was not yet lost, as with someone in such a high position as Roosevelt making the public aware of what had happened, a larger movement for the release of the Port Chicago 50 slowly began to grow as the next couple of years went on. That eventually led to such a storm of criticism against the military's unjust actions taking place that in January of 1946, they were forced to backtrack when they freed all of the imprisoned men, under the condition they remain in the Navy and were assigned to bases in the Pacific for a one-year probationary period afterwards. Was that a perfect result? No, but at least the wrongfully convicted were now free from prison and had their basic human liberties back. That wasn't the end of the situation either because, realizing just how discriminatory the whole incident had been and how damaging it was for the black community, then Chief Counsel of the NAACP, Thurgood Marshall, decided to push for a full government investigation into the Navy's ongoing practice of assigning African American servicemen to segregated support roles where they often worked under incredibly unsafe conditions. Sure, it wasn't an easy thing to do, but in the end, his hard work and continuing to pursue the matter paid off as in 1948, a full four years after the disaster and subsequent imprisonments, President Harry Truman issued an executive order that formally desegregated the military and allowed for black servicemen to have better and safer opportunities while they were serving their country. For as big as a victory as that was, it still hurt that so many men had to die needlessly for things to get to such a point, especially as most people don't even remember it happened at all today. While the story of the Port Chicago 50 would, to some extent, disappear into the annals of history in the decades afterwards, it wouldn't go completely forgotten as the whole situation has since been credited with the U.S. Navy changing their safety practices to make sure something like the Port Chicago disaster doesn't happen again. On top of that, in December of 1999, some measure of justice for the whole incident would finally be achieved when President Bill Clinton formally acknowledged the unjustness of what took place by officially pardoning Freddie Meeks. As for the other 49, however, they've still yet to have their names exonerated and with all but two now dead, it seems less and less likely that will happen while any are still alive. Sure, in 2014, Secretary of the Navy Ray Mabus personally endorsed executive action in favor of doing that for the remaining convicted, as would House Representative Mark DeSaunier not long after that. But as of this recording, none of that has come to fruition yet, and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. With that in mind, what is the legacy of the Port Chicago 50 then? 
Is it that African-American servicemen during World War II could be unfairly imprisoned for asking for basic training, and the military could get away with it effectively scot-free after the fact? Or is it that such a horrible page in American history eventually led to new safety measures being implemented, meaning countless lives would be saved in the future? In truth, it's both of these things, just as it's also a reminder that justice is often a difficult thing to come by. Even almost 80 years after the fact, during a time when we like to think our world has become a far better and more inclusive place for all people. The lessons that can be learned from the Port Chicago disaster are numerous, and it's precisely why it should never be forgotten again. This is exactly what led to the Veterans Legacy Program partnering up with San Francisco State University recently in order to create a film highlighting exactly what happened on that fateful day, keeping its memory alive for future generations in the process. All we can do then is hope this is enough to make sure it stays in the public consciousness going forward because, as the saying goes, if we forget the mistakes of the past, then we're only doomed to repeat them. And when it comes to incidents like that which took place on July 17, 1944, letting such a thing happen again simply cannot be allowed to be an option. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.